And then the night of the 29th, about 14 minutes past midnight, we encountered a Japanese sub. Honestly, as I tell it, it's more than just telling it, I can relive it. I can, I can see and feel and hear. As the United States moved full steam ahead into the Second World War, many young men like Edgar Harrell of Murray, Kentucky, could hardly wait to graduate before joining up with the armed forces. Well, as an 18-year-old, I was working on the farm, basically, and going to high school. And uh, I knew what was happening in the Pacific. And I tell my dad, Dad, I don't want to wait and be drafted. I want in the Marines. And I'll go to the draft board and tell them that my number hadn't come up, but uh, I'd like to join the Marines. And uh, they were kind of excited, you know, a 17, 18 year old boy wanting to get in the Marines. I go to San Diego boot camp, and after boot camp then, uh, they said, uh, Prophet Harold, you've been selected to go to sea school, which meant that I would be sea going. And so I go through some six weeks of schooling and they sent me up to San Francisco. Then they take me down to the, the dock, and there was the big USS Indianapolis, and that's going to be my home for the duration of the war. The USS Indianapolis was a heavy cruiser of the United States Navy. Aboard ship, Edgar would experience combat throughout much of the Pacific theater as the Allies worked to undo the ferocious conquest of the Imperial Japanese Armed Forces. Oh, I went through, I think, uh, maybe 10 battle stars with them, Kwajalein. Then I was at Saipan, Tinian, Guam, Sea Battle of the Philippine Seas, where our task force shot down 403 Japanese aircraft that day. I was at Iwo Jima, and then I was at Okinawa, and it was at Okinawa that we received a suicide plane. One of his bombs went all the way through the ship at a big gaping hole there to the extent that we had to make our way all the way back to the States for repair. And that kind of changed our directions for the duration of the time I was in service, yes. The Indianapolis returned to the Californian coast and underwent successful repairs. It was then that she received orders for a secret mission, the results of which would determine the final outcome of the war and change Edgar's life forever. From there, then, we uh, pick up a top secret cargo. I was a corporal at the time and happened to have the guard duty, and my Marine captain came to me and said, uh, we've got a, something coming aboard. We don't know what it is, but it's a big, big, big crate what are we guarding? He said, we don't know. And then suddenly there were two proposed to be Air Force officers coming aboard. They had a little canister in a metal cage and a padlock on it. What is that? Who are these Air Force officers? Well, they weren't Air Force officers. They were scientists from Los Alamos, New Mexico. And what they had was a component, a little boy, the uranium that would ignite that first atomic bomb. I don't know what we have, you know, at the time. President Truman knew because the 16th of July, they detonated the first atomic uh, bomb in Los Alamos. Then we get underway then uh, real soon. I mean, we went as fast as that ship would go. We go to a place there in, in Tinian and someone comes and they take that big crate and they take that little uh, 
a canister too. After successfully delivering its cargo, the Indianapolis set course for the Philippines to prepare for the upcoming invasion of Japan. But the ship would not reach its destination. And then the 29th, the night of the 29th, about 14 minutes past midnight, we encountered a Jap sub. Honestly, as I tell it, it's more than just telling it, I can relive it. I can, I can see and feel and hear. I got off a of watch that night at midnight. And so I go below deck and I get uh, my blanket and I go topside and I go all the way forward to number one turret. I made me a pallet right down on the deck under the barrels of that that gun and uh, probably just began to doze off. About 11 or 12 minutes after midnight, Commander Hoshimoto, he picked us up with a little periscope just barely sticking up out of the water. We couldn't see him, he could see us. We had no underwater sound gear. They sent us out unescorted. He was surprised that we were alone. He fired six torpedoes. And that first torpedo, not knowing what it was, but I knew that something happened up there. I could see, I could see all of that water and that flame going high in the air. And then uh, maybe two seconds later, another one hit under the number two turret, the big eight inch guns. And then I could see that about 30 feet wide and about 30 feet of that bow of that ship. It's not there. All of that water is coming in and I know that the, the ship is doomed. And there were those who were coming from inside and you could see that uh, they were flash burned for them trying to get out. They touch a bulkhead. They leave the skin of the hand on the bulkhead and now they're pleading. They're out in the open now. They're pleading for help, but there's nothing that this Marine Corporal, you know, could do. And by now the bow of the ship, it's under. We're listening to the starboard to where you can't stand on the deck. You're waiting for word to abandon ship. Well, for the good captain up there with no electrical power, no speaker, no nothing, all he can do is as loud as he could, abandon ship, abandon ship, abandon ship, and then to go over then to that rail then and grab a hold of that rail, you know that uh, you're going to be leaving the ship or the ship is going to leave you. But as I get there, I hold on to that rail. And may I say, uh, there's times when you pray, and there's times when you pray. And I knew to whom I was praying, and I tell the Lord that I don't want to die. I knew that a certain brunette back home that was going to wait for me, mom and dad, I don't know what all I promised the Lord, but I want to live, I want to live. And may I say this, I can hear him today. Peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Let not your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm holding on that rail. Don't be afraid. And I knew that somehow, some way, I'm going to make it. And I did not have the least idea what I was going to experience the next four and a half days. I left the ship and swam away to see that bow of the ship go under, see that fantail come up, and uh, I saw boys as they were jumping off, and some jumped into those screws as they came down. They couldn't see what's below, but they dared not allow themselves 
to be brought under. And it isn't long until maybe 80 of us or so. Here we are in that little group. I asked, uh, any Marines? Well, there were two Marines. One was a new Marine that had just come aboard in San Francisco, and uh, and he was not uh, in my squad, so I didn't know him, but I could tell that he was wounded desperately, but he was dying, and he basically, I held on to him. He died, really, in my arms there. Then I found another Marine. That was my buddy, Spooner. And he'd gone into the water head first, and can you imagine what you look like and how it's going to affect you if you would dive into a half inch of, of that black oil that was just covered, and he can't see, uh, and he's desperate. It's a long story with Spooner there. So much that he had to experience now. Morning broke and you could look out at any time and you'd see a big fin swimming around and around. And, and you were kind of in their road and they go through and they don't bother to miss you. They hit you and that's the end of you, you know. Uh, you'd see someone out by himself. You would hear blood curdling scream and you look and you see it go under two or three sharks there. You go and check your buddy and you find that the bottom torso is gone. Uh, he's disemboweled and uh, so that's gonna take place just so, so, so many times. Now the sun comes up and when that sun came up, it wasn't appreciated at all because it's 110 degrees. Now, where are you gonna get your water? You don't have any water. And some would dare uh, maybe to drink a little salt water, but just wait a little bit. That brain with all of that salt in it, that man doesn't know straight up. He doesn't know you from a jab. Uh, he may take his seat knife out and he stabs his buddy because he's a jab. And so we're losing, boys. And a little rain cloud came over and you turn your mouth heavenward and you, you're so thankful for that water. But if you could just see those faces, you'd see that they're all covered with oil. You know, you hold your mouth open or you try to funnel some of that water in. But when that oil and all gets down in the tummy, it isn't long until that tummy says, we've got to come out and it comes out. So you have no water, no water. So the third day at noon, there's, uh, there's 17. And then all of a sudden we saw something out there. Look, look, look. Well, it looks like it's, look like it could be a raft. We are making our way, no doubt, toward them. They come to us. They came into our group and they said, uh, the sun goes down in the west and the Philippines is there someplace. We're going to head toward the Philippines now. May I say, we didn't know it was another 500 miles to the Philippines, but it's time to do something. Anyone want to join us? And I say to my buddy Spooner, I'm, I'm going to go, Spooner. You're going to go with me. And, and um, well, uh, no, he wanted to commit suicide. He said, I'll swim down so far. I'll drown before I'll come back up. I said, you're not gonna do any such thing. We're gonna, we're gonna go with that little raft. And those other sailors, they said, you're crazy. You can't swim to the Philippines. We said, yeah, but we can't make it if we don't try. And we start out. Those uh, sailors that refused to go, not a one survived. We're making some headway. And we came upon a swell, and I, I saw something out there. 
And I thought, I'm going to swim out and see what that might be. And they said, oh, but it's just uh, some, some debris. Uh, and I said, I feel I've got to go. And I said, I'm going to go. And I made my way out there to whatever that is. It's just an old slatted crate. But as I got closer and closer, you know what was in that? Potatoes. I recall reaching in and getting that first potato. And as I got a hold of it, the rot to squeeze through my fingers, rotten potatoes. But as I squeezed it, you know what? It was solid on the inside. And then to take that potato and peel that rot off and spit it out and have just a little bit of potato on the inside. And my buddies see that I'm eating something. What is it? And I make my way back kind of halfway we met and and that's the water that we got and that's uh, the food that we had for four and a half days swimming. Uh, we can't all hang around that little raft and um, my buddy Spooner that had wanted to commit suicide, I said, Spooner, turn your back here. Yeah, I'm going to tie you on where you can't, where you can't get away. Daylight begins to break this fourth day, and uh, somehow or another we kind of drifted away from that little makeshift of a raft, and uh, and I'm with this Navy Lieutenant McKissick and one sailor. And every little bit I checked this sailor because I'd seen this so many times. You know, it's easy just to drop your head in the water, and his head was in the water. I shook him and he was still alive. The second time, he's still alive. The third time, he's gone. So it's just McKissick and myself. And uh, we know that we can't, we can't make it, but at least we could converse a little bit and we could pray. We see planes flying at 30,000 feet, our B-29s bombing Japan. But then all of a sudden we saw and we heard a plane. Here he is out on a search and destroy in that Ventura. Lieutenant Wynn said, I looked down. He said, I thought I saw a flash of light. But as he started down, he came a little ways and he could see every way you look, bodies, bodies, bodies. Shark, shark, shark. But I can see him today when Lieutenant Gwynn came down and circled over McKissick and myself. I can see his face in that plane as he circled us two or three times and he goes up and he breaks radio silence and he gets in touch with Adrian Marks, a pilot of a PBY. This long until he gets there. They told him, you can't land, but he said, we, we have to land. And the crew says, we will back you. We have to land. He said, I'm gonna try to run a swell. He tried, but that right prop would never run again. The damage inflicted on the PBY upon landing made it impossible to take off again. But Commander Marks and his crew were able to provide a safe haven for some 56 sailors and marines until further help arrived. All he can do is pick up stragglers. When I got aboard, uh, one of the first men that I saw was Spooner. He finally got that undone and hung onto that raft, and, and here he is talking to me. And then that destroyer came in. Now we're transferred aboard. Of the 1,200 Marines and sailors aboard the Indianapolis at the time of her sinking, only 316 survived to see their rescue. A weary but elated Edgar was returned to the United States and after a slow recovery, 
reunited with more than just his family. A certain brunette heard that the Indianapolis was sunk, and she rushed her mom and said, Mom, Mom, Ed was aboard. Then, of course, they talked about 100% casualties, but that brunette waited, and I got home, though, later, and, uh, yes, loved her to no end, but... Uh, I felt that I'm too much of a wreck, and I tell her that that uh, I think we need to just steer clear until I can um, come to myself and and be worth you waiting for. And we waited, we waited, and then then finally we decided it's time. We were married then in. 47, two years after the sinking of the Indianapolis. Edgar Harrell lived out the remainder of his life publicly sharing his story to honor those who were lost in the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. To the day of his passing in May of 2021, Edgar never ceased giving thanks that he survived those terrible days in the Pacific in the summer of 1945. Oh, you can't imagine. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Even today, I cannot make contact with the Lord without just remembering, remembering. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Even today, thank you, Lord, at 96 years old and still able to tell of your mercy and your grace. Yes, yes, yes. Hi everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II, and I just want to say thank you for watching this episode. Our goal is to capture as many World War II veteran stories as we can from all over the world, but we can't do it alone. If you'd like to help us in this mission, consider supporting us through Patreon, and check out our website, memoirsofworldwar2.com, for more information. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our channel, and click the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. Again, we want to thank you for your support, and thanks for watching.